Good answer. Uh, we have a question right here, the microphone. And if you could please uh, wait for the microphone before answering and, and your name and affiliation would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Ibrahim Owais from Georgetown University. The speakers had eloquently stated the reasons for internal reforms as well as the forms of external assistance. But what I did not hear is that in the absence of peace in the Middle East, those exercises are not at all be complete without achieving peace. And uh, uh, in this regard, I may say that unless the United States pushes Israel to, for peace, then uh, all of the disturbances of the Middle East will continue to unfold, and it is time for the United States to declare its independence from Israel. Okay, I'm, we only have seven more minutes, so I'm gonna take uh, three questions uh, uh, at a time. Uh, uh, Dr. Iqbal Zubair. Thank you. My name is Zubair Iqbal. I'm a scholar with the Middle East Institute. Um, whatever you have said, I have no quarrel with it. I've got two points. One, we have a very small window of opportunity in these countries. If we cannot turn things around within the next one year, we'll have lost the advantage. So the question now is, what is it that we can do in that one year which will be able to tie the countries over to the medium term, which is the most difficult part? Second point is, from my long experience with the International Monetary Fund, I've come to conclude Unconditional funding is the worst thing that you can do to a country, even with the best of intentions. Up to now, all the funding that has been provided or committed to Egypt and other countries through the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, or other bilateral donors is largely unconditional. It's going to be very difficult to get any results out of it unless we have very tight, strict conditions. It is good for the country, it's good for the institutions, it's good for the world. Thank you. Okay, there's two, two statements. Do we have a question? Right here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, all the speakers. My name is Ibrahim Hussein, American in, in, in Washington, D.C. I did not hear the word religion mentioned in any of this discussion. What, uh, what is happening big in Egypt now? What is the role of organized religion and religion faith in development? And how much this will help or hinder uh, the development? Okay, do our speakers want to respond to this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to address the point uh, raised about the window of opportunity and the issues around funding being conditional or unconditionally. Firstly, the IMF, I believe, has concluded the, the package for Egypt. And my understanding is that the IMF has showed some sensitivity about that because uh, people want to see a Egypt able to proceed to the timeline that's been uh, set of moving to elections, uh, design of new constitution. In other words, uh, I suspect the thinking has been that to come in with the, the kind of IMF package that perhaps characterised an earlier era might have upset the apple cart, and that wasn't going to be helpful to uh, the transition. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't be too sort of dogmatic about a, a small window of opportunity because I take a long-term view of what's happening. I, I think this is a very, very long-term process here. We don't know entirely how it's, it's going to turn out, but a journey's been started. Uh, certain course is being charted. It may be changed, but I, I don't think the, you know, the IMF's going to be, want to be, to be blamed for in any way you know, up, upsetting things as at least the next steps are taken uh, towards elections and uh, design of a constitution. Uh, so that, that would be my reflection on that. Uh, for, for the other issues, uh, what can I say? I mean, peace in the Middle East is extremely important. 
and uh, all diplomatic efforts to that uh, end by this country and others are uh, extremely important. On the role of religion, I don't uh, purport to have any expertise on this, except to say that I, I do sincerely hope that in the new Egypt, ways will be found to uh, have good relations and dialogue across the faiths. I think that's extremely important to the future uh, of, of Egypt. There is a significant Christian uh, minority. Uh, there are a range of views within uh, Islam uh, itself uh, that also need to be uh, talked through. But, you know, in my previous life, I was very involved in supporting interfaith dialogue within the Asia Pacific, where all the great faiths of the world and, and, and the non-believers too are, uh, are well represented. And I, I put a, you know, really a lot of priority on trying to get people to discuss what unites them rather than what divides them. Ned, final yeah. word? Well, Israel and peace, of course. It's what we all would like to see. Uh, but it's not just Israel. And uh, I think that you have to understand uh, or you have to accept that uh, you've got to have two parties to playing in this game now. Uh, it is a divided situation. It is not comprehensive side against another side. It's also an unequal balance with Israel being a nation state and uh, the Palestinians not being a nation state. Uh, that creates a lot of problems in any kind of negotiation. Uh, but uh, the point I think that the United States has made for many, many years, and I would expect is still making, is that you cannot force peace on people. Unless they buy into it, it won't last. It won't be there tomorrow. And so trying to force Israel to do something is not the answer. It doesn't mean you can't have pressure. It doesn't mean you can't encourage. Uh, but it certainly doesn't mean that you can crack the whip and say, okay, you will agree to this particular arrangement. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, I think it's important that we continue to press. Uh, I've been encouraged that despite the setbacks, the fact that the president uh, has been uh, damaged uh, by some of the reactions of the parties, uh, and most recently by Bibi Netanyahu, uh, nevertheless, he's willing to go on and continue to keep acting in it because it is in our national interest that this take place. Um, and I firmly believe if you start looking at demographics and you start looking about the future, it's in Israel's national interest as well to find a way out of this box that they're in. Otherwise, there will not be a free Jewish Israel in the future. There's going to be something else, and it's not going to be something that the Israelis want. So we need to deal with this. We need to deal with it now. Uh, just one thing on religion. You know, religion can be a great asset. When I was an ambassador, when I was ambassador to Egypt, one of our programs was to try to build out uh, spacing for children and limit the uh, population growth, uh, encourage uh, uh, contraception. Uh, and how did we do that? We went out to the countryside and we talked to women. Uh, and we talked about their health and spacing and their economy and so on. But the most important and crucial factor was we got the imams, the guys to come in from the, from the mosques to say, yes, this is what you should be doing. This is good. This is important. This is not against your religion. And that helped immensely. And properly managed, we can see the religion in this part of the world as an ally for the things that we think is important. It won't happen if we start thinking that they're always against us or if we keep hysteria about Islamic uh, this, that, and the other thing. But to start working with the religious organizations to do things that they want to see done, to have a better life for their constituents, I think is also possible. Well, I want to thank all three panelists. It's been a, uh, a very rich conversation this morning. Thank you so much. Excellent. Excellent.